This is not a story of my life. It is a story of my society, driven by the need for social change. And that's the big name in our country. My job is about result. It is about fostering development, but the stakes are always high. The night of the 12th of last month, the rebels did attack Taru, bent down some houses, looted others, and captured the chief of the village and several of his people on suspicion that they were trafficking in arms. The crown prince of Bole informed the preceding guy reporter Anas Arendel and the two traveled to Cote d'Ivoire with a journalist disguised as a prince from an imaginary kingdom. My kind of journalism is very risky. It comes with all the traps and the threats. Every second counts. As I decide to take the risk, any miscalculation can lead to fatal consequences. Our lives involved. It is classified and sensitive. It can be deadly but important. It is often in the interest of the state. It is never a solo mission. I don't do this work alone. I do it with a team. I collaborate with civil society, foreign counterparts. We meet an undercover Ghanaian journalist, institutions, and other security agencies. Together, we name, shame, and jail the bad guys in the society. I don't try to be all things to all people. I only try to do everything for the good of my society. My name is Anas Arunyal Anas. My methods may not be comfortable to the bad guys. But extreme diseases call for extreme remedies. I am about to knock on the door, and I can tell you it is not nice. Courageous journalists like Anas, who, who risked his life to report the truth. Take his spark, just his spark, and I think Anas has provided that spark for the whole edifice to blow up, for people to wake up and say, no more, something has to be done. and gentlemen I can't hear the good evening well good evening ladies and gentlemen great now I feel I'm home this is Nairobi I mean we are not in London so we all have to feel at home it's an honor to be here and um, I'm glad that I've already seen some of my talented colleagues I want you to know that we are here to learn from each other nobody is a master in the game and I must say a special thank you to the one who managed to pull me from my hole because it was very difficult at this moment to come out since we have a series of work that are lined up to come out very soon. But Mr. Warungu, please, a round of applause for him. <laughs> my name is Anas Arimiyawa Anas. I'm an undercover journalist from Ghana. Anonymity has always been my secret weapon. Those who know me will tell you that I do three main things. I name, I shame, and I jail the bad guys. Listen, this is not conventional journalism. It is my own thinking of what journalism should be. Because I have always said, 
in very simple terms that as African journalists, as we grow up, as we pick up the mantle, we do not need anybody from any Ivy League school. Call it Columbia. Call it Harvard. Call it anything you want to call it to define what journalism is for us. The essence of journalism is about doing things that benefit our society. I live in my little village in Ghana. No Westerner, no BBC journalist or Al Jazeera journalist can come and tell me the problems of my people. I know it much better. And so do you all. Nobody can tell you the problems of Kabira than yourselves because you live there and you know what pursues or what happens within those enclaves. So I say that before I call anybody a criminal, I'll give you the hardcore evidence. Hardcore evidence put together with my hidden cameras. I'll show you when you plotted to steal, how you stole it, and where you took, took that stolen item to. That's the journalism I believe in. Ah, there is nothing irritating than doing a piece of work and seeing that evil person that you have pursued walk on the same street with you. I'm also a lawyer by profession. So, when I gather my hardcore evidence, I go to the court of law. I testify. And then these bad guys go to jail. Talk of the Chinese sex mafia. They are in jail for 45 years. Talk of the Nana Kwesiajiman story. He's in jail for, this is a story where a man ya raped girls as young as three. He's in jail for 15 years. Talk about the cocoa smuggling story. They are in jail where our top security agencies um, eventually colluded to steal cocoa, which is a hard, a, a cash crop in Ghana to neighboring countries. They are in jail for 16 years. So you see, what I'm telling you is not about practice. It's about what I have done and I have seen results coming in. You can study African journalism over the last 100 years. And you tell me what the, what's the results we've had. What we have attempted to do over the years is to create monsters because we scratch the surface of the stories and it emboldens the bad guys and they come after us. If you look at the index, CPI, you see that the number of African great journalists who have fallen over the years, it's alarming. Because we do not take care of our people well. When I say our people, I mean the bad guys. We do not ensure that we do it up to the end. So I am saying in very plain language that I take journalism as a boxing ring. And I say that there could be split decisions sometimes, but usually... One wins. Sometimes people go by knockout. With my hardcore evidence, I'm able to tell stories like that. I'm also not unaware about the fact that some of you have critiques about my work. It's all welcome. I am here. And I'm going to explain. And I want all of you seated here to be part of what we will see. And to ask yourself, if you were in my position, how were you going to behave? You see, when you are in school, it's a different ball game. But when you get into society, and you really want to impact on the lives of our grandmothers and sisters, in the society, you ought to think differently. Do not allow anybody to teach you how to sweep your own house. It is your house, and perhaps you know which is the best broom to use to sweep it. I will start with an illustration from home, and I am very sorry. I didn't come here to filter images. I came to tell you the story as it is, because in the first place, you are my brothers and sisters. If I cannot tell you the truth here, where else can I? Please, let's start with the video. And I'm sorry, the images are not exciting. 
So I was undercover in an orphanage in Ghana, Osu Children's Home. Lots of kids died. And then, you know, when you are here, you come face to face with the reality of the world. How young children are treated. And I had witnessed so many deaths within this place. This is another one called Careless. It's also in an orphanage. And this is how poorly and badly they are treated. You can't have to keep asking yourself that if you don't want to go undercover, what else would you do to bring such hardcore evidence? This one is Dr. Dra. And if you could pause for me. This man had an operation theater. And here, young innocent girls who would become pregnant would go there for abortions. You see, we live in a society where people frown on abortions. And so the girl who is going for this abortion is already very shy. He doesn't want anybody to hear about it. Dr. Dra puts you on the medical table and in the middle of terminating the baby, he says, I have to sleep with you to remove the membrane and then make you make the abortion safe. Now, if it were you, what would you do? You want to get up from the theater table and go home with half done abortion or you want to continue? By his own confession, he had slept with 52 women. And all this is done in, the, in that room. And then you are telling me that I shouldn't go undercover. I shouldn't film it because it infringes on who, who, who's right here. Please proceed. So I went undercover in the hospital and then got the evidence and again he was arrested as we speak we have started the legal processes now undercover in the cooler was when i went undercover in insawan prisons i was a prison inmate this was the conditions and i bet you it's not different from what we have here these are realities at the end of the day if anything should happen to us this is where we will go this is the story of the society as we do all this, at the end of the day, when we get back there, these are the stories we will be expected to tell. And there will be bad guys here. In fact, it was easier to get cocaine, cannabis, and heroin in the prison than on the street. And my friend, this is Enoch, my friend, he died whilst we were in there. And I remember following the dead body to the morgue. And he died because of negligence. Pause. See, I want to emphasize that as African journalists, if we do not dare to think differently, things are not going to work for us. Look, when you read American history, you see Nellie Bly, all of them, all those great journalists, they also had that era in their history where they had to sacrifice. Zongo Jiwa and other great African journalists have suffered. It is our turn. And I'm saying that we are in a hurry to put fundamental structures in place. And as journalists, as we sit on those stories, we lose human lives. When I sit with my colleagues and they tell me, okay, we have a research investigation to do. And it's about food production and the life, the life of a butterfly. I say that is good journalism. That is great. But Africa does not have time for this. Because there are many kids dying. Many people dying out of famine. So you see, your journalism is as important as it is today. Even though you are in school. We need it. If we want to save the continent. Please proceed. 
So, in this story, there were pregnant women who were... Proceed, please, play. Pregnant women malnourished children who were supposed to get some food. Yet, some people decided to make do of it. Instead, he is selling the food to make money for himself. My undercover team have told both of our corrupt nutrition officers to expect another visit from us the next day. We didn't want to cause a scene by arresting him at the health center and potentially alerting our second target in the nearby town. This one, I bought them from your warehouse. It's a warehouse. Yes. Just here. From here? Yes. Hey. Two bucks. I said, you are, no, he said he's selling this, but I don't know. For me, this job was done. But for these two, their ordeal has only just begun. A police officer fires a warning shot into the air. Out of those arrested, only the nutrition officer was ultimately charged. The others were helpers and didn't know the goods had been stolen. Since 2000 in northern Tanzania, Tanzania the spell of the albino. albinos who were killed, 16 who had limbs amputated, and the bodies of 12 albinos were exhumed. Within two weeks of our investigation, two limbs had been chopped whilst we were in Tanzania, Wanza. As you can see, this is an African story. No European can tell it better than you yourself. And when I meet these people and I gather the hardcore evidence and we arrest them and we put them in jail, you say that is not journalism. So tell me what journalism is then. Continues for half an hour talking about curses, black magic, and the need of special medicine to boost my luck and success. Part That's of our journalism is to break the superstitious myth that engulfs the African continent. That is what it is. He's, he's what? Sorry for what? We got him. Yes. <laughs> Nigeria's fake physicians are taking a heavy toll on unsuspecting patients. Two African journalists go deep undercover into the disturbing world of quack doctors. It's time to go undercover. One fake doctor, Dickin Austin Owl, to seen here in the car is getting away with an outrageous calm. But Anna's plans to give him a dose of his own medicine. I'm going to that place and pick him. Anna sketches out his plan. The police take up station outside the clinic. How Inside many of these don't we have in our society? He his bogus examination, he heads to the back room, presumably to pick up his dirty syringe. Oh, Terrified, Anna slips off the bed and follows him. The police force him to wear his stethoscope to publicly shame him as a fake doctor. Say you are a doctor, put it in your neck. Put it in your neck. So, my brothers and sisters, as we embark on this journey, we should know that it comes with a lot of risk. Our lives will be called into question. Society will call us to answer those questions that the politicians cannot answer. But it will take me and you to have that strength and that courage to be able to push the frontiers of our democracy. You see, we live in our various villages. We do not live with anybody else. As you see on the screens, the risk would always be there. And we are not the first to face those risks. Our forefathers, great journalists, in them, the Azikiwe, Zongo Jiwa, and all those great guys suffered it. It's our turn. The road is not going to be rosy. It has always not been a bed of roses. But we have to focus. And when we focus, 
the realities will come to play and we would be able to triumph. Now, we are going to a very last slide. It's called justice. But before justice, let's do the spirit children. See, born deformed or with disability. And I keep say, talking about the myths that hold us in captivity as journalists. The superstitious myths. What do you see there? It's a story I did between Burkina Faso and Ghana. Children born with deformities were given concoctions and killed. So you give birth to a child who is exceptionally sharp at a young age. He starts mentioning names and they say, look, this child must be evil. So they feed him with concoctions and they kill them. Then again, I collab collaborated with the Ghana police. We built, built a fake door undercover. We got ourselves prepared. And as you can see, the police in action, the killers were arrested. You could write this story for a bedroom, but I would rather choose that these people go to jail. Please, some volume. History of Africa and the extraordinary man who carried it off. It doesn't matter who you are, wherever you are hiding, I come with my cameras. Al Jazeera has been recording what happened. At the end of the investigations, we got 34 judges. Huh? Ajit Nassam is one of Ghana's most senior judges, sitting in the High Court and dealing with the most important cases. In Tamale, northern Ghana, Anas's investigators went to see if they could influence the outcome of a rape case. It was an appeal hearing. This is Ansuji Abo. Ansuji Abo is a well-respected High Court judge. The judge is anxious nobody should know that he accepted the cash. I beg you, let this thing remain this way. Okay, my lord, okay. John Ender Bugri is one of a number of lawyers Pause. acting for the Pause. judge's name. Justice. 146 judicial staff caught on camera taking bribes. 34 judges. As we said, I, the last count, I had 66 legal suits. As for the death threats, they are normal. I'm sure we, we are all used to it. It's, it's just normal. So. But that's the price you pay for it. It was a big story. It came with a lot of problems. But then it's sanitized. You see, judges are almost the gods in the guise of men in our society. They are our last hope. So when someone goes to murder and a judge will take money, to free that person then we have a problem in our society and i'm not talking only about ghana you know what's happening in kenya you know very well you know what's happening in nigeria how many of us will be courageous enough to hold that hot iron and push those frontiers to ensure that we have a proper democracy so in carrying this story it came, it came with its ramifications. And I guess the video should play on, please. And shamed in the film, thousands of people have been given free tickets to see the undercover epic, which features 34 judges filmed allegedly accepting bribes. A police convoy escorts Anas's car because he's received several death threats. This is just as dairy. He's one of the judges who have really tormented me in this investigation. He's filed many, many suits. This is male. He actually said that normally it's 10,000 plus when you're dealing with the likes of Justice Derry because he's a big judge. Newly qualified graduates are called to the bar in Ghana. This is a joyful occasion, but Anas's expose has also cast a major cloud over the proceedings. The saga has not impressed the Chief Justice. Sometimes you take a spark, just a spark, and I think Anas has provided that spark for the whole edifice to blow up, for people to wake up and say, no more 
something has to be done. So, as we speak, one key thing about my kind of journalism is that it stands legal scrutiny. Because if you claim that you have filmed someone, your information is not sacrosanct. It ought to be subjected to proper legal scrutiny. So there was a committee that was set up by the judiciary to investigate this. And so each of the lawyers will come with, each of the judges who were caught on tape and the judicial staff will come with their lawyers, sometimes six, other times eight. They will cross-examine you for God knows up to when. But truth is one. It cannot change. That's why truth should be your, your cross. Truth should always be the fundamental thing you look at when you engage on those journeys. Because at the end of the day, that's what will set you tr- free. And do not think that you can get away with lies in journalism. Because they will catch up with you very, very soon. So 22 of them, as we know now, have been fired. Some are still undergoing legal scrutiny. I'm not bothered because the facts I have are sacrosanct. And I believe that they are the truth and nothing else. They've been challenged severally in courts. I've always won. And I believe that even in the near future, if I embark on any journey, I'd still take those lessons into consideration. Now, one key thing that we should put in our minds as African journalists is that we have to redefine journalism according to our continent and the context in which we operate. Else we will lag behind. Look, it is our continent. Our problems are very different from those in the West. I'm saying that democracy in America and the UK is going through all the sifting through and cleaning and all that. And it's good today. And we can clap for it because people sacrifice for it. I'm saying that this kind of journalism, if you went back into history, there were times that it was absolutely necessary for those iconic democracies. We are not yet there now. It is our turn to sanitize our democracy too. And we cannot sanitize that democracy by swallowing hook, line, and sinker what has been cooked in Harvard or any other part of the world. We can only combat our problems if we look deep into our society and ask ourselves. I see nothing wrong with taking one step and joining that security officer. Is it not public good that we are looking for? So, under the name of exclusivity, some of my colleagues, oh, this is exclusive to me. The story is exclusive to you, but the story, but the people that it affects is not exclusive to you. It's about human life. How exclusive can that be to you? If you indeed believe that you want to protect that person from dying, what is exclusivity about that? If you share with the law enforcement officer, You can be described as anything. You are in bed with government. You are in bed with... We have always collaborated. You talk about the BBC and talk about the CNN. How do they fund their work? Yet, when an African journalist gets some funds, we get the criticisms coming. One thing alone, I charge all of you. As we live as journalists, we must always believe that being original in our thoughts is the best way of nibbing societal problems. See, the problems that engulfs us, I have always called extreme diseases. And when you have extreme diseases, you need extreme remedies to combat those diseases. And I have always belonged to that extreme remedy. Thank you very much.